evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Grable. I am pleased to welcome you this evening to our event, A Closer Look at Mammography and Breast Wellness, with Dr. Caitlin Lopez. Dr. Lopez is the Medical Director of Women's Imaging here at Berkshire Medical Center. She is board certified in diagnostic radiology and specializes in breast imaging. She graduated from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and completed her residency in diagnostic radiology at the Mallinckrodt Institute of Radiology in Missouri, where she was also fellowship trained in breast imaging. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lopez. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here this evening and hope to share a little bit of information about current trends and issues in breast imaging. Um, I look forward to hearing your questions at the end of the presentation, so please write them down um, as you think of them as we go through tonight. There we go. Okay, so just an outline of our program this evening. We'll talk a little bit about some current facts and figures related to breast cancer trends in the U.S. We'll also talk about um, current recommendations for screening and diagnosis of breast cancer, including your imaging options, uh, your risk assessment, and also just general screening guidelines. Then we'll also um, go into what to expect when you visit the Breast Imaging Center for your own uh, mammogram or other breast imaging. Finally, we'll, con we'll conclude by sharing some resources that are really good uh, tools to further your education. So currently in the U.S., um, a very commonly reported statistic is that one in eight women will develop breast cancer over the course of her lifetime. In 2021, that's estimated to result in 285,000 new diagnoses of invasive carcinoma in the U.S. and an additional 50,000 cases of in situ carcinoma. So uh, in situ carcinoma is the earliest form of a breast cancer when the tumor cells are confined to the milk duct or the breast lobules where they started. That's by definition a stage zero breast cancer, whereas an invasive carcinoma is when the tumor cells have started to break through the walls of the, of the portion of the breast where they started. Um, and then uh, we also expect to have uh, just over 43,000 deaths from breast cancer in the U.S. this year. Another commonly cited uh, fact is that breast cancer incidence increases with age. So the older you get, the more likely it is that you are to develop breast cancer. So a woman who is 40 years old, uh, the incidence is 1 in 1,000 women who are 40 will be diagnosed with breast cancer. And then that increases a little bit each year to get to an incidence of 2 per 1,000 by age 50 and 3 per 1,000 by age 60 and so on. That said, no single decade of life accounts for more than 25% of cancers diagnosed. So they're still pretty evenly spread over those decades, meaning that about 25% in the 40s, 25% in the 50s, and so on. Um, notably, um, more than 40% of life years lost are among women who are diagnosed in their 40s. That makes sense because um, a woman in her 40s is at baseline anticipated to have more life years ahead of her um, as it is. So certainly there's a higher risk of losing more life years at the, at the younger age of diagnosis. One really important uh, point that I really like to drive home with people who question um, how worthwhile screening is is that since uh, screening mammography became widespread uh, really in the 1980s, the mortality, um, meaning the deaths from breast cancer, um, has reduced by greater than 30%, with some estimates even approaching 40% since the onset of routine screening. Um, so that's a really tremendous benefit to uh, routine screening as a way to prevent um, cancer morbidity and, and mortality from breast cancer. The reason for that is because breast cancer screening helps to identify breast cancers when they're at their earliest stage, um, when they are more readily treated and less likely to have um, metastasized to other parts of the body. So the goal of screening is really to identify cancers before they are clinically apparent, meaning before they're palpable or before they have caused other problems. 
So um, a couple of terms that are frequently uh, used in breast imaging are screening and diagnosis. So I want to be sure that you have a clear understanding of what a screening evaluation is and what a diagnostic evaluation is. They use the same equipment, but um, each of each type of test is just a little bit different based on the types of pictures that are taken. So a screening mammogram or a screening study is completed in women who don't have any symptoms. It's part of routine health maintenance and it's something that a woman comes for her screening, she has her picture taken, she goes home, she's notified of her results by mail or by phone if there is a finding on her screening mammogram that warrants further evaluation. Although most screening studies are done in asymptomatic women, there is a subset of um, men who do benefit from screening mammography. And it's always just important to keep in mind. I think we often forget that breast cancer is a very real illness among men as well. Um, so as I said, a screening evaluation is for women who don't have any ongoing problems and it's just a routine health maintenance exam. A diagnostic uh, mammogram uh, or a diagnostic mammogram and sometimes ultrasound and happens in a couple of situations. One is if a woman has presented for her screening mammogram and an abnormality was identified at the time of her screening. In that situation, the woman will be called back for a diagnostic evaluation, at which point some extra mammogram pictures and sometimes an ultrasound might be done. The other situation that a diagnostic appointment is appropriate is if the, the, the patient or her referring um, physician or clinician identifies a specific area of concern to be evaluated. So if, uh, for example, if a woman feels a lump, or if her doctor feels a lump on, um, on a routine physical exam, uh, if there are changes in the skin, uh, if you notice nipple inversion, if you have an area of focal pain. So any specific concern is a reason to come for a diagnostic mammogram rather than a screening mammogram. Another difference um, between a screening and diagnostic evaluation is that at a diagnostic appointment, women um, receive their results during the appointment. So we take the images, we uh, reach a consensus about what we think is going on, and then come up with a recommendation. And we talk to the, um, to the patient about that while she is there for her appointment. So you leave that appointment with a plan in place. So um, mammography is really the workhorse of breast imaging. It is the first line um, and standard of care imaging test. I know a lot of people have interest in ultrasound and MRI, and we'll talk about those in a little bit, but really mammography is your first line study. It's really a, a, a wonderful um, tool. So as I mentioned, screening mammography kind of first came to the limelight in the 1980s. At that point, it was, um, it was what we call film screen, where an actual uh, printed out image was obtained, and the radiologist would look at it on a view box with light projecting behind it. Um, it's kind of hard for me to imagine even what that would be like because I grew up in the digital era. And so um, that, you know, over the next decade or two, um, really film screen mammography was replaced by digital mammography or what we now refer to as 2D mammography, which is um, when the images were obtained and stored on, as, as digital files on, on computer systems. Over the past 10 years or so, breast imaging has evolved to what is what we call digital breast homosynthesis, which is also commonly referred to as the 3D mammogram. And we'll get into those details a little bit, but that's pretty much the standard of care now. Is um, 3D mammography is, is widely available um, and is, is the kind of standard of care at this point. All mammography is x-ray based, meaning it's essentially taking an x-ray picture of your breast tissue. It's a very low dose, very low radiation dose, and um, the radiation dose for um, 2D digital mammography is comparable to that of the 3D digital breast homosynthesis. Um, we like to give an estimate of what that dose is for women who are, who are sometimes interested to know. It's about three millisieverts. That's a measurement that really no one's going to have familiarity with. I don't really have familiarity with it as far as a practical standpoint. But what you can um, think of it is, is it's equivalent to a couple of weeks of what of your background radiation from just living in, on Earth. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very low dose um, study. And certainly the benefits of screening far outweigh the, the risks from the low dose radiation. Even if you have annual screening mammograms beginning at age 40 for the next several decades. So some of the 
benefits of mammography are that it is standardized, meaning it's a very reproducible test. Um, there are standard positions that a woman is put in to obtain the pictures. Um, yeah, anyone who's had a mammogram knows that compression is part of, the, part of the process. Compression is a really important part of the study because it holds the breast stable to help get us get a clear image. Um, and it helps in that standardization so that we can reproduce the images. Mammography is highly regulated. It's regulated both by state and federal guidelines. And so um, that should provide you with reassurance that you are getting a quality picture because we have to prove to both um, state and federal organizations that we know what we're doing and that we know how to take good and diagnostic pictures. The other part of mammography that is standardized and really um, helps uh, women and breast imagers across the country and world is that even the interpretation of mammograms is standardized. There are certain guidelines that we have to follow when we generate a, mem a, a MERA report um, describing what we see on the mammogram. We are required to comment on the density of the woman's tissue, so that is a standard entry in the report. And the other thing we're required to do is give an overall assessment of what we think is going on. And that's something called the BIRAS lexicon. That's not a detail that you know you need to have a grasp of at this point, but it's the last line of every mammography report wherever you go. And so it's a really good way for us to communicate with other breast imagers or other referring clinicians. So the standardization of mammography is a really good quality control check because we can you kind of know what you're getting when you go for a mammogram. The other um, really uh, positive thing about mammography as far as feeling good about it as a, as, a, as a test to have is that mammography has been highly studied and it's evidence-based. So traditionally, um, mammography sensitivity is at about 85 to 90 percent, meaning that a standard mammogram detects about 85 to 90 percent of breast cancers that are present at that time. For some, you might feel a little worried that, oh gosh, well that's 10 to 15 percent of breast cancers that might not be identified on a mammogram. That's true, but as technology has improved, that number is creeping upward. So I would anticipate that, you know, as we get more larger studies reported in the tomosynthesis era, that that, that sensitivity number will, will reliably be over 90 percent. Um, as I mentioned before, the evidence is strong to support screening mammography as an excellent way to reduce breast cancer mortality, meaning that translates into tens of thousands, and at this point, hundreds of thousands of lives saved from screening. The other thing, because it is so um, well studied and has such good evidence to support its use, mammography is widely available, it's accessible, people can even self-refer for a screening mammogram, you do not need a doctor. Um, to prescribe it for you, and mammography is um, covered by insurance. So that all supports um, its, its use as our first line test in breast imaging. I mentioned um, the evolution of digital breast homosynthesis, or the 3D mammogram. As I said, it's really come um, to the forefront over the past decade or so. Here at Berkshire Health Systems, we are 100% um, homosynthesis, so all of, our uh, all of our equipment and all of our sites um, is is tomosynthesis. We use that same equipment for both screening and diagnostic evaluation. The only difference between screening and diagnostic studies are the types of pictures we take or the position that we place the woman in. Um, so the, the images at the bottom of the screen all the way to the left is just a standard um, mammography suite. And so you can see um, the, the unit, that again, if you've had a mammogram, that will look familiar to you. This platform is where the breast goes. This is the compression paddle that comes down. And then this tube is um, where the x-ray comes from and to transmit the x-ray um, through, through the breast to acquire the image. This is the technologist's workstation where they can see the images as they're obtained and make sure that they're positioning you appropriately. Uh, this schematic diagram to the next of it indicates the two standard views of each breast that are obtained during a screening mammogram. So the CC view is the cranial caudal view. That's when the breast is compressed from the top down, kind of, um, you know, a top to bottom view, which is demonstrated in the image right next to it. So this would be a cranial caudal projection where the compression paddle comes from the top down. And then the medial lateral oblique projection is when the breast is imaged at an angle. 
And this uh, image at the end shows that angle here where you have the tube at an angle and the woman's breast is compressed at that angle. That gives us two pretty comprehensive views of the breast to let us see a lot of that breast tissue. This final schematic here illustrates what digital breast homosynthesis does. And what it does, so here's the platform that the breast rests on. Here's the diagram of the breast itself with the compression paddle on top of it. And then this demonstrates the x-ray tube, which um, travels an, uh, of an arc of about uh, plus or minus 15 degrees to acquire a series of x-ray images. So digital breast homosynthesis takes a lot of um, x-ray images that are then combined into a single um, data set. So bear with me, I'm going to um, show a demonstration of what that homosynthesis does. I just need to stop sharing my screen for a moment, and then we'll be right back. Okay, so this animation will demonstrate what homosynthesis does. I'm going to play it, and I may pause it for a moment. So here you see uh, the woman's uh, breast, here's the nipple, her shoulder, her head. This little ray of light is a schematic or an animation of the x-ray. So you can see that that tube travels in the arc and acquires a series of images that are then reconstructed. They're one millimeter slices and they're all put together to form a comprehensive image of the breast. That then we, as radiologists, as we interpret the images, are able to scroll through and get a really comprehensive look at all of the individual slices. And this uh, image happens to show um, a suspicious mass here um, in, this, in this breast. So that's something that would require further attention. But um, so that's basically just a little overview of what how tomosynthesis um, works and how we're able to scroll through it. And I'm going to just go back to our main presentation. So um, here is um, an example of a, a recent mammogram um, that, that we saw here in Pittsfield. Um, so this uh, slide is, is titled Synthesize 2D. And so what that means is that we are able to generate a synthesized 2D image of the breast that mimics what the, um, the standard 2D digital mammogram is but with, without having to expose the woman to more radiation. So we take that 3D data set and we generate a 2D image from it to give us just an overview of the breast tissue before we look at the tomosynthesis slices. So these are the four stand, these are the uh, two standard views of each breast for a total of four images. So this is a typical screening mammogram. Um, these images are the cranial caudal projections where the breast is compressed from the top down. This would be the right breast, the right cranial caudal, and this is the left breast, left cranial caudal. Even though um, the left is on the right side here and the right is on the left side, everything in radiology is flipped. So this is truly the right breast, this is the left breast. And then this is um, an image of that medial lateral oblique projection where um, the woman's breast is at an angle. So we can really see a lot on a screening mammogram. Um, the ways that we see a lot are we really pull you in so that technologist will really make an effort to get all of that breast tissue in there. So it may be a little bit uncomfortable, but it's just for a short period of time to make sure we really get that posterior tissue. Um, and that compression really helps spread the tissue out to make sure we get a good crisp image. So I'm just going to orient you a little bit more to each of these images. So this is the, um, this is the skin surface of the breast. This is the nipple right here. So on the cranial caudal projection, this part of the breast tissue is the outer part of the breast. And likewise on the left, this is the outer part of the breast. This is the inner part of the breast. So the breast that's closer to your sternum or, or your breast bone. And then this is the inner part of the left breast. As we shift over to the medial lateral oblique projection, here's our nipple again as a good landmark. This is the upper part of the breast. This is the lower part of the breast. And this line right here demarcates the breast tissue, and then this um, kind of dentin behind it that forms that V-shaped there, that's your, that's your pectoralis muscle. So that's your chest wall muscle. So that lets us know that we've included a lot of that posterior tissue. We have to, and I, I mentioned that standardized imaging earlier, we're required to see pectoralis muscle on our pictures. If we don't, it's not a technically adequate image, and we would repeat it. 
So now I'm going to show you um, that same image. So this is the right breast. Here's the cranial caudal view. And here's the medial lateral oblique view. And this is the tomosynthesis version of that image that I just showed you. So these images are generated in that same data set. And what we do when we, when we um, look at them is we basically scroll through them. So this will show you what that's like to watch to, for us to do it. You can see that breast tissue moving. And this breast actually has an abnormality, which is highlighted right here. And you can see that it really stands out um, once we are using that tomosynthesis, it really pops out and lets us get a better look at that breast tissue, um, particularly in what would be considered a fairly dense breast. This is a dense breast because it has a lot of this white hypoglandular tissue. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So then this is that same breast just in the other view, and here's the tomosynthesis of that. Again, you can see I'm kind of scrolling through the images, and that abnormality really pops out. Um, once we get to where it is in the breast, it becomes crisp. And we say, okay, we have a finding that needs further evaluation here. So before we go on to what that would look like as far as further evaluation, I'm going to talk a little bit about breast density. This is a very, um, over the past couple of years, probably actually approaching five to 10 years now, this has been a very common topic um, in, the, in the media. Lots of talk about breast density. And the majority of states now have passed state laws requiring um, us to include a comment about breast density in the mammography report. The reason for that is that breast density is an independent risk factor for breast cancer, meaning that the more um, breast tissue, the more fibroglandular tissue there is in the breast, the higher the risk a woman has for developing breast cancer. So there are four standardized um, categories of breast density. Again, this is another example of how regulated and standardized mammography is, which is great for quality control and assurance. Um, so this would be considered in, um, predominantly fatty tissue. You can see this is very, this image has very little white in it and is predominantly dark. So fat is dark on a, on a mammogram or an x-ray. And the, and the white are some of the support structures of the breast and also what we call the fibroglandular tissue. And so this is a breast that's predominantly fatty. This is not a dense breast at all. The next category is called scattered fibroglandular density. And so you can still see here that there's more um, white in this breast than there is over here, but it's still there's quite a bit of the dark fatty tissue as well. And then as we progress along, this would be considered heterogeneously dense, which means that there's quite a bit more of that fibroglandular tissue, um, that, white, that white density on mammogram. And then as we get to extremely dense, even more so, almost the entire breast is fibroglandular tissue. So fibroglandular tissue is what um, we refer to when we say women have dense breasts. That means we have a lot of fibroglandular tissue and not a lot of fatty tissue. It does not necessarily have to do with the amount of body fat a woman has. It can be separate from that. Um, and the fibroglandular tissue is what is also hormonally sensitive tissue in the breast. So sometimes when women have a lot of breast pain associated with their menstrual cycles, it's because um, this fibroglandular tissue can be sensitive to hormone fluctuations. So um, the, the kind of take home is that um, every, every woman has a certain breast density. It can change a little bit over the course of her lifetime. But for the most part, um, during a woman's adult life, it kind of is what it is. And um, it's not necessarily anything you're doing or not doing, um, with a few exceptions. But we'll touch on those in a moment. Um, the majority of women have scattered or heterogeneously dense. So most women fall into either this category or this category. So um, what are some of the things that we might see on a screening mammogram or a diagnostic mammogram? Like what are some of the findings that might be mentioned in your mammography report or that might require further evaluation? So calcification are actual little mineral deposits of calcium in the breast. It does not have to do with your, your dietary calcium intake. Um, and they look like little white dots on the image. So almost like little grains of salt on the image. So calcifications are very common. Many women have them. Most of the time they are benign, meaning nothing to worry about. 
but sometimes scalp indications can be on the earliest sign of a breast cancer. So we pay attention to them, and if they're new or different on a mammogram, we may bring you back for some extra pictures. Another common finding on a mammogram is something we call an asymmetry. So this arrow demarcates a little asymmetry. And what an asymmetry is, is when there's just a little spot of density in a place that there shouldn't be density or that looks a little asymmetric compared to the other side. That's the reason we have, we always take two pictures of the breast for screening is because we really benefit from comparing, from comparing the right to the left because we expect them to be symmetric um, in, in a woman for the most part. So a little asymmetry is when some of the breast tissue stands out a little bit differently than the rest of the surrounding tissue or you're like, huh, this is really fatty tissue there really shouldn't be this little spot right here. I'm going to investigate that further. Another common finding on a mammogram is what we call a mass. And a mass is something that takes up space and is seen in two views of the breast. So here we see that cranial caudal view and the medial lateral oblique view. And we see this mass on both images. It's something we can measure. It takes up space and it's discrete on both images. So that's what we would call a mass. And then another common finding that we see on mammogram is something that we call architectural distortion. And what that means is you can almost see, this is a zoomed up uh, image of what this arrow is pointing to. What architectural distortion almost looks like a little spider. You can see those little spicules um, extending out from it. But it's not so much that we have a discrete mass that we could put measurements on. So I like to, to describe architectural distortion to women is, is um, an area of the breast tissue where some of the breast tissue is just being pulled into a central spot, causing that kind of um, spider-like or, or spiculated appearance. So when a woman is found to have something, or a man is found to have something on a mammogram, um, like a mass or a distortion or an asymmetry, um, we will often do some extra pictures in addition to those um, standard cranial caudal and medial lateral oblique views. We'll often do kind of what we call a spot compression or a spot magnification view of the area where we kind of just focus on that area to get a better look at it. And then if that finding persists, like it does here, so here we see a density here that we think corresponds to what looks like a mass here and is confirmed on that spot view. So at this point, we say, okay, we have a true finding on this mammogram, and this requires further evaluation. This is at a point where um, ultrasound would come into play. Ultrasound is an excellent um, tool for to aid in diagnosis. Um, it's a complementary study, meaning it's not often a standalone study. Ultrasound is most effective and most helpful when it's done in addition to a mammogram. Um, evidence from lots of studies that have been done does not support ultrasound as a population-based screening tool. It has not been shown to have any effect on mortality related to breast cancer. Um, a couple of differences uh, from ultrasound compared to mammography. Remember we said that mammograms are very standard and reproducible? Well, ultrasound is operator dependent. It's a dynamic study, meaning it's something that's done in real time as the sonographer takes um, pictures. And it can, it can vary um, from time to time when ultrasound is done. Part of that is that breast is not in compression. A woman is often on her back for an ultrasound rather than standing upright like for a mammogram. So that breast tissue can kind of roll, roll around and it's not held stable. And you can also imagine it, particularly for women who have larger breasts, that, that rolling of the tissue can really um, affect uh, our ability to consistently find something on ultrasound in a, in, a, in a reliable area. It could change even as much as like how much we roll the, the woman up on her side, if we prop her shoulder with a towel underneath it. So um, ultrasound is really a, a study that's best interpreted live, meaning um, we record images from it, but it's really something that, that's done in real time to help us make our assessment. Whereas mammograms can be looked at, you know, hours after they're taken and have just a, a good interpretation. The other thing about ultrasound is it can be very time consuming. The technologist um, needs to spend a lot of time to obtain um, really high quality images. That's fine, we're happy to spend the, the time to do that, but that's also one of the limitations as far as offering ultrasound to everybody as a screening time. Um, the, the thing that people really like about ultrasound is that it does, it's not radiation based. 
so it uses sound waves, so there is no radiation dose. The true strength of ultrasound, though, is to characterize masses. There are plenty of breast problems that have no role for ultrasound, um, but, uh, but a definite role for ultrasound comes in to help us characterize a mass. So on this last mammogram, we saw a mass that we wanted to, to get a better look at. And so what ultrasound does is it helps us look at the internal characteristics of that mass. So, um, for example, this image demonstrates a cyst, which is basically a pocket of fluid. And we can tell that definitively based on ultrasound. There are features about this that we learn about to know that this is a cyst. For example, it's completely black, or what we call anechoic. It transmits the sound wave through it. You can see this brightness behind it. That tells us that this is fluid. And there's no blood flow in it. Um, conversely, a solid mass is not nearly, it's dark, but it's not black like this. We don't see that increased enhancement behind it, so sometimes we can in certain situations. And oftentimes we're able to see actual blood flow in these, in these solid masses. I included these two pictures in the center just to give you a sense of what we see in normal breast tissue on ultrasound. This thin gray stripe at the top is your skin. The darker kind of lobulated tissue um, under the skin in this image is the normal fatty tissue of the breast. This band of white tissue that kind of is kind of undulating or like forms a wave here, or a little peak, that's the fibroglandular tissue. So on the mammogram, this white is, off, is what we see as white on the mammogram as well. And then we get down to this kind of stripy tissue under here. That's your pectoralis muscle. That's your chest wall. And then this is actually your lung down here and your ribs. So we are able to get a full thickness view of that breast tissue, which is reassuring. So I'm going to use this example again. This is the same image from a couple of slides ago where we have this mass. Now, okay, so we have that mass. Now, how are we going to um, evaluate that further with ultrasound? We have to know where to look, right? Um, because we don't just do a whole breast ultrasound. We do what's called a targeted ultrasound or a focus exam based on what we saw in the mammogram or if, if the woman or a referring clinician has indicated an area of concern, we just address that area. So the way that we know um, where to go is we consider the breasts like this. So this is a little diagram of um, a woman. So here's her right arm, here's her left arm, her left underarm, her right arm, and the circles represent the nipples. And so when we identify something in the breast tissue, we are looking at the breast as if we were looking at a clock. So this is the left side. The upper central part of the, the breast is considered to be 12 o'clock, the lower central 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and so on. And likewise, the right breast, the same, um, the same pattern. So we look at the breast like we're facing a clock. So we know from what I told you before that on this view, this is the outer part of the breast, and this is the upper part of the breast. We know this mass is in the outer part and in the upper part. So we know to look in the upper and outer quadrant of that breast on our ultrasound. And so the sonographer will really focus um, their attention on the area between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock to look for this mass. So that's how we know where to look on ultrasound. And in this case, our sonographer found a corresponding mass on ultrasound as we expect at the 2 o'clock position. So we expected that it was going to be between 12 and 3. And um, this is a good correlation for the um, mammogram. It looks like the mammographic mass. It's the same size as the mammographic mass. This is something that we would biopsy. I just included this image to show you that we do biopsy with image guidance. So this is our biopsy device, and we're targeting this mass. And so we know that we have a nice sample of that area for diagnosis. All right, so we're going to transition to talking about MRI a little bit. MRI is also a very um, popular topic in the, in the media, and also there's lots of interest in MRI um, among some, some women because people have heard that MRI is, is a very sensitive test for breast cancer, which is true. So there are two types of MRI that we do in breast um, imaging. One is an MRI that's done without intravenous contrast. That means you just come get your pictures taken, there's no contrast given. This is not a way to look for breast cancer. You need contrast to look for breast cancer. The purpose of this MRI is very specific. It's if a woman has um, indwelling silicone breast implants and either she or her um, physician are concerned that there might be a leak from that implant. 
So that is the only indication for a non-contrast breast MRI is if you have a silicone breast implant and you're worried that there's a leak from the implant. Women who have saline breast implants do not need any uh, imaging with MRI to assess for that because if, if the saline is like a water balloon. So if the saline um, develops a hole, you know right away just um, by looking at yourself in the mirror because that implant will uh, deflate pretty much in real time. Um, whereas silicone, you can definitely have a, a leak without noticing a, a, a real change. Okay, but the, the, the real um, point of interest here is MRI with intravenous contrast because this is what is um, most often relevant. So there are three indications for having an MRI with intravenous contrast. For screening, for staging, and for surveillance. So a screening MRI is comparable to a screening mammogram, meaning it's, part, it's, it's an asymptomatic woman who's doing it as part of her routine health maintenance. But not everybody falls into a category that has been shown to benefit from screening MRI. So currently, um, screening MRI is reserved for our high-risk screening population, which is a group of women who have been found to have a greater than 20% calculated lifetime risk for developing breast cancer. In a moment, we'll talk about what some of those risk factors are. But the important number to know is that the cutoff to be eligible for a screening MRI is a calculated risk of 20% or higher. Just like ultrasound, MRI is not a standalone study. It's really best interpreted in conjunction with mammography. Um, studies have consistently shown that screening mammography plus screening MRI each year combined results in a greater than 92% sensitivity for identifying breast cancer in high-risk women. The other um, indication for breast MRI is staging. That means um, a woman who has just been diagnosed with a breast cancer, MRI is sometimes done as part of preoperative planning um, to get a better sense of how much of the breast might be involved by tumor, and also to look at the other breast, or what we call the contralateral breast, the breast on the other side, to make sure there isn't anything else that needs attention in that breast before the woman goes forward with her definitive treatment for her breast cancer. Not everybody who's been diagnosed with a breast cancer needs a, a staging MRI. Again, it's a select group of um, women who uh, benefit, who may benefit from that, and that's something that we discuss as a multidisciplinary um, conference with radiology, surgery, medical oncology, and radiation oncology to make sure the women who might benefit from it um, get that as part of their evaluation before going forward with treatment. Um, the last uh, indication for MRI with contrast is what we call surveillance MRI. And that, it, you could think of that as very similar to screening, meaning surveillance is um, kind of a technical term that's reserved for women who have had breast cancer in the past and who both who are, have, are, have, are, have long since completed their treatment and are just doing an annual surveillance with MRI. Again, most women who have a personal history of breast cancer do not um, meet criteria for surveillance MRI, but some women do, um, particularly women who are diagnosed with breast cancer um, at a young age, so like premenopausal breast cancer, or women who have very dense breasts might benefit from surveillance MRI. So this um, just shows an example of what a breast MRI looks like. This is um, a, kind of a, 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 an overview image of the entire breast tissue. And just like uh, with mammogram, where you have different, uh, different amounts of kind of background tissue, with MRI, we can get that same effect, but instead it's a result of the enhancement patterns in the breast after we give contrast. So this image in A, there's a lot of black in this breast. These white lines, those are the blood vessels. But the rest of the tissue is pretty dark. So this has really minimal background enhancement. We love these MRIs because if anything lights up, it's easy for us to see and it stands out and we know to pay attention to it. That next one, this would be something that has mild background enhancement, meaning you see lots of these little white dots everywhere. They all look very similar to each other. And so these don't really concern me because they all, again, it's symmetric in both breasts. They're kind of scattered uniformly throughout the breast. And this just looks like a few areas of enhancement in normal breast tissue. As we move along, this would be moderate enhancement. This gets a little bit trickier for us to interpret because once you have a lot of um, areas lighting up in the background, it makes it harder for us to see the areas that are lighting up differently. And then likewise, this is marked enhancement, meaning this is entirely filled with 
enhancement. So it's really hard for us to pick out um, some enhancement that might be due to a breast cancer as opposed to enhancement that might be due to normal breast tissue. But that's part of our training, and so um, that's how we learn tools to kind of tease that out. This is, um, again, just an example of what it looks like for us to look at an MRI. So this first image I'm going to show you is basically the breast tissue um, like a, a, from like the top down view again. And so we basically scroll right through it and we're able to scroll back and forth and it lets us see that breast tissue in its entirety. Some things that we, whoops, sorry. Some things that we see, we see the breast, we see the, the pectoralis muscles, we can even see a little bit of the thyroid, some heart tissue, some lung tissue, but really our focus is on the breast there. And then we also look at images from the side. And so this is what images look like as we scroll through them from side to side. So um, I mentioned that MRI um, is really indicated in a subset of, of women for screening purposes. And that has to do with a woman's um, risk for developing breast cancer. Risk is very individual. Um, and women um, have different risk factors that contribute to that overall assessment. So there are two general categories of risk factors, some that we call non-modifiable and some that we call modifiable. So non-modifiable means things you can't change, whereas modifiable means things that you can change. Um, those risk factors go into some algorithm to um, estimate or calculate your own personal risk and then another part of that is what to do with that information, so how to interpret your risk score. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of those now. So I know there are a lot of words on this slide. Um, this lists some of what we call those non-modifiable risk factors, the things that you cannot do anything about. You can't do anything about your age. And as we said, age is an important risk factor. For, for most people, as they get older, the risk of breast cancer increases. Your gender, women are at higher risk than men. Um, and there are some ethnic groups um, that have uh, higher risk for uh, breast cancer. Uh, one is the Ashkenazi uh, Jewish population. Um, to, uh, that's often based on a certain genetic mutations that they are more prone to have. Um, the other is African American women. Even though uh, white women are more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer, that gap is narrowing. More and more black women are also being diagnosed with breast cancer. But um, black women are typically uh, diagnosed um, at a later stage than white women, um, and meaning they present with a more advanced uh, breast cancer. And the other factor that, um, and, and one of the factors that contributes to that is that African American women are more likely to have what we call a triple negative breast cancer, which is a subtype of breast cancer that tends to be more aggressive. Um, all of the factors that play into that are not well understood, but that um, does contribute to, to risk. Um, another uh, familiar topic for risk is genetic mutations. Um, although genetic counseling and genetic mutations get a lot of discussion, especially um, you know, Angel Angelina Jolie brought that to the forefront a number of years ago when she talked about her own uh, BRCA mutation, um, the vast majority of breast cancers are not um, directly traceable to a genetic mutation, but it is still an important consideration. About 15% of all breast cancers can be linked to a gene mutation. The most common ones are listed here, and the one that you're probably most familiar with is the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. Family and personal history is an important risk factor. Uh, people who have one first degree relative um, have a twofold uh, increase in breast cancer risk. Women who have, or, or people who have two first degree relatives have a threefold. So first degree relative is a parent, sibling, or child. Um, and so you can see that family history does have a big impact on that. Another category of uh, risk is uh, women who have been diagnosed with what we consider to be a benign but high risk type of breast pathology out of prior um, biopsy, specifically atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, and lobular carcinoma in situ. Those diagnoses carry a four to five um, fold increased risk. So that's even stronger than multiple first degree relatives. And then we talked about breast density before. Breast density in and of itself is an independent risk factor with anywhere from a one and a half to three fold increased risk. The denser the breast, the higher that relative risk is. 
And then this last comment about age at menarche, when you get your first period um, and age at menopause, um, really speaks to the um, overall effect of hormone environment on breast cancer. Uh, breast cancers are very, um, you, you know, it, it, it's thought one of the risk factors is a woman's overall lifetime exposure to estrogen. So women who get their periods at a younger age or have menopause at a later age have an overall cumulative exposure to estrogen over their lives. Um, now we're on to risk factors that you may be able to do something about. So kind of building on that estrogen exposure, a woman's uh, BMI or body mass index um, is, is a risk factor because once you go through menopause, you don't have a lot of that um, estrogen production by the ovaries anymore, but the main source of estrogen is actually your body fat. So your body fat can convert to estrogen. So um, a higher BMI after menopause is associated with a higher risk of breast cancer. Um, alcohol consumption contributes a little bit higher risk. Um, the more you drink, the higher the risk goes. Um, like with anything, we encourage exercise as part of a healthy lifestyle, and we're from 100 to 150 to 300 minutes of moderate exercise, exercise per week is ideal. Um, so contraceptive use and hormone replacement kind of tie into that um, kind of estrogen uh, exposure that we touched about or that we talked about. So contraceptive use is associated with a slightly higher risk for breast cancer. That risk normalizes, meaning that effect um, kind of goes away 10 years after you stop. Um, oral contraceptive use. Likewise, hormone replacement therapy confers a 25% increase in breast cancer if you have used it for four or more years, and that risk also goes away five years after you stop using hormone replacement. I put obstetric history in italics because um, a woman's obstetric history is not something that she entirely has control over. Um, but uh, the, the important point about um, the obstetric history is that women who do not have children or women who have their first full term pregnancy at age 30 or older do have a higher lifetime, uh, that is a risk factor for, for breast cancer. So there are a number of um, tools or algorithms to calculate a woman's uh, risk. Um, and the purpose of those is to identify women who are at higher than average risk who might benefit from some extra screening in addition to mammogram like that MRI. Risk assessment calculations are a good way to guide your discussion with your primary care doctor about what might be best for you. And risk assessment or risk calculation is supported by multiple national advisory organizations, including the American Cancer Society, the National um, Consortium of, of Cancer, American College of Radiology, Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Breast Surgeons, all support uh, doing a risk assessment in women. The risk assessment tool that we use here at Virtual Health Systems is the Tyracusic version 8, which is widely regarded as the most accurate and comprehensive um, algorithm to identify or to, to estimate a woman's risk. You can see all of these things that are listed are, are plugged into that formula to generate your, your risk. So, and there are all things that we mentioned on those previous slides, your age, your um, body mass index, when you got your period, if and when you had your first full-term pregnancy, when you went through menopause, if that applies, and um, so on and so forth. So a lot of, uh, we, we account for all of those um, personal and, and family details when you come um, to the breast center. So what does it mean? So you give us your information and we generate a number. So average risk is considered to be um, a number that's less than 15%. Um, intermediate risk is considered between 15 and 19 percent, and high risk, as I said, is 20 percent or higher. Um, risk is dynamic, meaning it can change from year to year. Uh, your own personal or family history might change, as a woman ages, her breast density might change a little bit. So all of those things can factor into your risk. So it should not, um, you know, it's worth the conversation, but it shouldn't alarm you if your risk one year is a little bit different from your risk next year. Many women notice a big change um, between their mammogram from late 2020 and 2021, prior to prior mammograms, because we switched to the, to the tyrocusic model in September of um, 2020. So we've just completed that first cycle of when women should have had their first risk assessment with tyrocusic. So you may have noticed a big change um, in tyrocusic compared to the prior model, which was not as comprehensive or accurate. And as always, like with anything in medicine, um, this risk assessment or calculation is always best interpreted with your primary care provider who knows you and your personal history um, best and can kind of interpret it in the overall context of your health care.
So um, as far as what to do with that information, um, as I said, average risk is considered to be less than 15% calculation. For, this, for women in this um, population, we recommend annual screening mammography beginning at age 40. There are a few situations where we recommend screening before age 40. I'll touch on those at the, at the end of this slide. But otherwise, we recommend screening mammogram once a year at 40 for average risk women. For women who are at intermediate risk, um, there really isn't enough data to, to advocate for or against supplemental screening with things like ultrasound or MRI. So the um, overall recommendation in this group also tends to be annual screening mammography beginning at age 40. And then finally, it's really only in that high-risk population with women who have a 20% or higher lifetime risk that we recommend additional screening with MRI plus mammogram. Again, they're the two together. We don't advocate for MRI to replace mammography. They're both best done in conjunction with each other. So I have that little asterisk next to the age 40 under these um, categories. So we would never advocate for screening to begin later than 40. That's the latest it should begin. But there are certain populations when we would recommend screening before 40. Notably, um, in women who have a family history of breast cancer and a first degree relative, so again, in a parent, sibling, or child, um, who was that, that person was diagnosed before age 50, then um, that person's relative should begin screening 10 years prior to that. So if they, for example, your mom was diagnosed at age 43, then you should begin your screening mammograms at age 33. So that's an important caveat that could apply to a lot of women. So it's 10 years before the age of diagnosis of a first-degree relative, but not later than age 40. Also, women who are known to have certain risk factors that place them in a high-risk category before age 40, they would recommend screening as soon as they know that risk factor, but not before age 25. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what to do to actually come get your mammogram taken. So things to think about before your visit to the breast center, um, certainly you have to schedule your appointment. Um, we have three imaging centers across the county, uh, certainly here in Pittsfield, also at Fairview, at Great Barrington, and at the satellite facility in North Adams. Uh, screening mammograms are available at all three facilities, and again, all are 100% um, digital breast tumble synthesis or that 3D mammogram. If you need a diagnostic evaluation or if you are called, you know, if you're called back from your screening mammogram or if you have a problem, you need to come to Pittsfield because that's where we, we offer our comprehensive breast services. We offer mammography, ultrasound, and MRI in Pittsfield. Um, but for screening studies, you can go to South County, Central County, or North County. Before you come for your appointment, it's really important that you think about your personal and family history and get as much information as you can because things like the number of um, relatives diagnosed with breast cancer, their age of the diagnosis, if anybody has a history of ovarian cancer, things like that really help us give you the best and most accurate risk assessment. So knowing your history is very helpful to us. Our risk assessment is only as good as the information you give us to calculate it. Um, if you have had mammograms at another facility, we love comparison imaging. It, gets, it helps us give you the best interpretation of your uh, current imaging. So we ask that you request imaging from the outside facility and bring those with you. And then um, we ask that you avoid wearing any lotions, powders, or deodorants the day of your visit. The reason for that is because some of those um, compounds can have a little bit of artifact or some um, material or mineral in them that can cause an artifact on your mammogram. And we don't want to have to bring it back for a technical repeat to get rid of that artifact. When you come to the breast center, you will encounter a whole team of care providers. As soon as you arrive, you'll see our registration and administ administrative support people at the front desk. Um, they provide a welcome and orientation to you, give you some instructions about where to go and what the next steps are. We have a full-time medical assistant who offers general support during appointments, particularly biopsy. She's a, a wonderful resource um, for us. Our care navigation team of nurses is most involved in post-appointment follow-up if anything further is needed after your appointment. And then um, certainly our, our technologists, so the women who are taking your images, um, they will ask you about that, that family and personal history. They'll enter the information to generate the risk assessment, and they'll take your pictures. All of our technologists are required to have subspecialized training in each imaging modality. So mammography techs are subspecially trained in mammography, ultrasound and ultrasound, and MRI and MRI. So everyone has had extra training in that specific imaging test. 
And then, um, of course, you have your, your board-certified radiologists, who are the doctors who staff the breast center. Um, we interpret your images, meaning we look at them and decide what's going on. We are there to provide consultation to you or your doctor, and we perform the procedures. So we do the breast biopsies. Um, our training is that we have gone to a four-year college. After college, it's four years of medical school. After medical school, it's the six additional years of training in this area. So a one-year internship followed by a four-year residency and a one-year fellowship in breast imaging for a total of six additional um, years after medical school. Uh, what you'll see at our center when you come visit us, you'll see private changing areas with lockers provided for your convenience to store, store your personal belongings. Um, there's a separate interior gown waiting room, so once you are in again, you do not go to the main waiting room, you go to an interior room that's, that, um, you know, separate from where people are coming to register for their appointment. We have state-of-the-art equipment with 100% digital breast homosynthesis, new ultrasound equipment, and we are consistently a certified breast center of excellence, which is an accreditation that's um, awarded through a very rigorous national assessment that we go through um, periodically. Our overall commitment to you is to be friendly, helpful, respectful, and courteous. Um, we pride ourselves on providing a safe and comfortable environment, particularly during the COVID era. Um, we have continued uh, full operation at the breast center, and um, you know, women have felt, I, I believe, very um, safe and comfortable with our protocols in place. And we really are there to walk you through the whole process. We provide comprehensive breast care, meaning we take you from screening to diagnosis. Um, to navigation if you are kind of a breast cancer, that treatment, and then survivorship afterward. We are all experts in what we do, and we are here for you. So what to expect after your visit? If you've had a screening appointment and your screening mammogram is normal, you will be notified um, by mail. You'll receive a letter in the mail saying, see you next year. Um, if you have your screening mammogram and we find something that we want to take an extra look at, one of our technologists will call you by phone to schedule that diagnostic evaluation. Um, if you have a diagnostic appointment, if during, as I said, your diagnostic results are given to you at the time of that appointment, if your results are normal, we say excellent, we'll see you next year. Sometimes we can think something is probably benign, meaning it doesn't need any further attention right then and there, but we want to see you a little bit sooner than 12 months, and so we'd say let's see you back in six months, and we would tell you that right then and there. Or if there's something that we need to sort out with a biopsy, we would help you schedule that before you left your appointment. And we would talk to you about what the biopsy involved and go over the consent and everything so that you have a good understanding before you leave about what to expect. For women who need to have a biopsy, um, all biopsy results are provided by phone. You do not need to come back for a separate appointment to get the results. We call you with the results and we go over everything with you by phone and walk you through the next steps. It typically takes about two to three business days to get the results after a biopsy. If anything further is needed from the biopsy, then that care navigation team of nurses really comes into play to help facilitate and arrange those appointments and follow up for you. Some numbers to kind of think about is you can kind of know what to expect. About 10% of women are called back from their screening mammogram for some extra um, evaluation. About 20% of those women who are called back go to biopsy, and about a quarter of biopsies that are done demonstrate a breast cancer. So in other words, out of 1,000 screening mammograms done, 100 women are recalled for extra pictures, 20 of those go to biopsy, and about five of those end up having a malignant result. We are here for you and are always available to answer any questions or address any concerns you might have. The best way to reach us is um, through the phone number to the, to the Breast Imaging Center at BMC, which is here on the screen, 413-447-2147. Option one takes you to central scheduling to schedule your appointment. Option two takes you to the front desk of the Breast Center to direct a call where it needs to go. I also included a couple of websites that I feel are really excellent resources and provide wonderful and clear education um, materials. One is the Society of Breast Imaging, and the other is the American Cancer Society. And um, they're, they're both really well done um, sites. At this point, um, I'm uh, happy to address any questions or comments that anybody might have. Okay, so 
Um, one question we have are any efforts to attract more African American to uh, Berkshire Health Systems for their mammograms? We do um, engage in community outreach. Um, the one that one event that really uh, proved to be very successful at the forefront of my mind is that we had representatives from the breast center out at vaccination clinics, at COVID vaccination clinics, and I think at um, one of those events we we scheduled 400 women for a screening mammogram, which is is wonderful. Um, but your question um, is is a, a, a good one and um, does speak to um, underlying disparities in access to care of, among different racial groups, and it is a priority for us. Um, we do work with local organizations, some outreach to churches, um, also uh, the Virtual Immigrant Center and other um, established uh, support services in, in the community to make sure that we're, we're reaching women who need to be screened. Okay. Um, next question is, how long does a mammogram last and how long is the compression? So, um, each each ex so the compression is placed on the breast for each exposure. So you do get a little bit of a break between each of those four screening views. Um, it's really a matter of seconds. It's a very quick acquisition. Um, I would say under, I haven't actually counted, but I would say probably under five seconds. Um, and then the compression is released, you have a little bit of a breather, and then we put you back in the compression to take the next view, and that's done four times because we do two views of each breast. Okay, can you talk about the relationship between breastfeeding and breast cancer? Is it true that breastfeeding reduces risk? Yes, breastfeeding um, is a commonly acknowledged and valid um, risk reduction tool. It's not a huge risk reduction, so it's not going to necessarily negate some other risk factors. Um, but breast, if you are able to breastfeed and are interested in it, we encourage women to do so. But as they say, uh, the, the, best, the best feeding is just to feed the baby. So it's okay if you can't breastfeed. The, the most important thing is to make sure the baby's um, cared for. Can you talk a little bit more about breast cancer in men? What's the risk and frequency? Sure. So, um, so as that first slide talked about women, um, we expect in 2021, 285,000 invasive cancers and 50,000 in situ cancers to be diagnosed in um, 2021. That number for men, um, I, I'm not going to get it exactly right because I don't have it um, as committed to memory as I do for the women, but it's more in the two to 3,000 range. So it's certainly real, but it's many fold, um, many factors uh, diminished compared um, to, to women. Um, men who are at greater risk for developing breast cancer um, are, are ones who have, um, you know, kind of the highest risk are the same ones for women as far as like hereditary cancer syndrome and some of those genetic mutations that we talked about. Um, I know I mentioned screening for men. Really, men who um, should be screened are men who have a personal history of breast cancer. So it's not like men who have a known genetic mutation are all coming for screening. It's really men who have had breast cancer who come for screening of the other breast after they've been treated. Okay. So can you provide some insight into the accuracy of BIRAD? Any suggested improvement to the classification? So um, BIRAD is kind of like a dictionary. So as far as a way to improve the classification, it's, it's not as though it's, some, it, it's, it's really just um, there are umbrella terms that we place things into. So um, I don't know that there's any uh, role for what I would consider to be an improvement to make them more accurate. Um, but what it is, uh, the BIRAD categories go from BIRAD 0 up to BIRAD 6. So BIRAD 0 is an incomplete study, meaning we want extra pictures or we want to see um, outside mammograms that haven't been retrieved yet. So that's a zero. A BIRAD 1 is a normal mammogram. A BIRAD 2 is we see something on the mammogram, but it's benign. Like it could be a known cyst or some calcifications that we know to be benign. BIRAD 3 is what we consider to be probably benign. So BIRAD3 is really seen in the diagnostic setting when we say, we see something, it doesn't need further attention now, but we want to see you sooner than 12 months. That would get a BIRAD3. And what we're really saying with a BIRAD3 is that we're, there's less than a 2% chance that we think that, um, that 
finding that we're describing is, is malignant. A BIRAD 4 means that we see a suspicious finding. We don't know what it is, but we recommend biopsy. A BIRAD 5 is suspicious, but it's highly suspicious, meaning that's expressed cancer until proven otherwise. Um, and then a BIRAD 6 is if a woman has a known breast cancer and has more pictures taken before that breast cancer has been treated. She would get a BIRAD 6. So those are the BIRAD classifications. Um, they're pretty straightforward and um, well recognized uh, nationally and internationally as far as the way to communicate what we're thinking. Okay, I have kidney disease and a transplant. Would an ultrasound be recommended for me rather than a screening MRI with contrast? Because I have been previously advised not to have ID contrast. I am at high risk with both family history and a personal history of atypical breast hypoplasia. Uh, that's also an excellent question. So although um, the, the evidence uh, support um, mammography plus MRI for the, to, to confer the greatest um, benefit and sensitivity. Um, there certainly are people who are not candidates for MRI, such as um, yourself, because you are correct that we ask for, for women with, uh, for, for people with um, chronic kidney disease, getting the contrast material um, may not be in their best interest. So in that situation, um, ultrasound certainly could be um, substituted. There's not a lot of data to support that, but that is done in clinical practice. Are there any other questions? I know we received a couple of questions before um, the session tonight um, related to MRI. And so I'm gonna try and remember those off the top of my head. Um, one was the role of what's called abbreviated breast MRI, breast MRI, and if women should just get MRI instead of mammogram. So um, what an abbreviated breast MRI is, is, is a shorter MRI test. So one of the pitfalls of standard MRI is that it's a long test. It can take 45 minutes, the woman has to be very still, um, can be a little claustrophobic inside the magnet. So an abbreviated MRI eliminates some of the series of pictures that we typically take, um, and it's just a shorter test that's better tolerated for people and would presumably also be a little less expensive. Um, so that is an area of active research right now. Actually, just last month in, in um, JAMA, a study came out supporting that um, or, or demonstrating that abbreviated breast MRI does um, have higher sensitivity. Um, compared to digital breast tomosynthesis. So that is an area that's actively being researched. It's not ready for prime time. I don't foresee it um, happening anytime in the immediate future, but that's something that's not going to go away. And I bet, you know, maybe five, ten years from now, that, that that's something that's going to be um, more at the forefront. Um, and the other question that we received beforehand is, how can a woman know if she needs an MRI and how can she access that here at, at Berkshire Health System? So, um, when you come for your screening mammogram, we do uh, that risk assessment. And if you fall into that high-risk screening category, you receive some information about our high-risk screening protocol, our, our, our high-risk program, which does um, advocate for annual screening MRI in addition to mammography. Um, we typically stagger those tests at six months, a six-month interval, so that we're seeing you twice a year, but you're getting each test only once a year. So, for example, say I had my mammogram um, in October, and I was found to be at high risk um, at the time of my mammogram, then I would plan on having my MRI in April, six months later, so that I was being seen twice a year, but that I would have my mammograms in October, my MRIs in April, and go from there. Um, and you can have your breast MRI done, done here um, in Pittsfield at, at the at breast center. So we do offer um, that, that service, as well as um, image-guided breast biopsies with MRI and ultrasound and mammogram. I think I've answered all of the questions that have come through the chat. I'm happy to leave it open for another couple minutes if anybody else has uh, any other questions. If not, then I thank you all for um, your participation. Please feel free to reach out anytime. Um, I'm always happy to uh, talk with uh, women and their families about um, their breast health, and we look forward to seeing you for your mammogram. Thank you so much, Dr. Lopez.
It was really wonderful to hear all that great information. And we will have the um, presentation this evening available on our YouTube channel, so you can go back and refer to it or share it with friends and family members. Thank you, everyone.